a Japanese time switch sent by Jerry and Rosie from Japan for our entertainment. And by Japanese, I don't think this is actually made in Japan, but it's apparently really popular uh, for use in things like street lighting and alley lighting and signage and stuff like that. I'm not sure it's actually made, but interestingly it says 100 volts to 240 volts AC, 50, 60 hertz, but it is a standard mechanical type time switch, so I'm guessing it's got a quartz mechanism or something. The instructions, does it say on it whether it's actually made? No, but I can tell you already that I've checked out the instructions and one side is in Chinese and the other side, well I think it's Chinese, I looked, I used the translation app set to Chinese and it showed as, uh, it came up as proper text and I, uh, looking at the English side, it's kind of got that Chinglish approach that it, it's kind of like, it's a rough translation, it's got sort of weird bits in it. Never fail to turn the minute dial in arrow direction. If turned it by force in the opposite direction, it, it, it be damaged. Do not turn directly the dial. If turned, it might soothe some trouble. The dial is divided into 24 hours. Set the time not to confuse the momming and the afternoon. But other than that, the instructions are very straightforward. The main thing is that uh, when you set this, you have to turn the middle and not the outer dial. And it's nice that it does have the sort of standard clock face in the middle, which correlates the outside, but you can't uh, turn that. If you did turn that too hard, it would uh, potentially damage it. So let's uh, power this up. It has a little flap in the front that clicks up, revealing the connection terminals. Not much. It's not one of you, it's certainly not something you'd want to use in line with the flex. It's something that would be mounted in the wall, and it does actually have mounting holes for uh, mounting on a wall or panel. Or it's got the DIN rail bracket uh, facility down here for mounting. So I have a flex somewhere. I have a flex here. Let's just unclip these connections and hook it up and power it. And then we'll open it. So if I just, uh, does it say live? It just says Power S1, S2, I'm guessing, well, power and load. It doesn't really matter which way around they go. It's AC. It won't matter which way around they go. But I, well, we'll find out inside which wires are common, and that would potentially be neutral. So I'm going to put these in here. I'm going to leave the earth tucked in out the way because it doesn't have an earth facility. I'm going to plug it in and see what happens. This is quite stiff flex. Plugging in, the little green LED shows that power is going to it. I can hear the quartz mechanism ticking away. Nice. So it has on override and a dull red LED comes on. It's got auto and then it's got off. Okay, so at the moment it's, uh, it's off and if that was wound round, it would click on, which it has. Okay, that seems logical enough. Unplug it. It keeps running for a while. This says open. That's kind of intriguing. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, is this a good idea? There's the battery. That's nice. You can change the battery. It's not too exposed from the front. Yeah, that's all right. So I can plug that back in now. That's nice that you can actually change the battery in it. That's uh, refreshing compared to many others. Oh, and off it starts again. Okay. And you don't need to open it up to change that, it's nice. Let's stick the terminals back out and open it up. I shall stuff these wires back into this knockoff uh, Wago connector. There we go. Four screws in the back. It wasn't powered very long, but it certainly is running for a good length of time, so it's put a decent charge into that. This is where it suddenly stops running now, I've said that. Is this all going to fall apart into piles of cogwheels? Nope. I'm seeing... Oh, and it's just stopped. 
have I disturbed something or is it just that it's run flat for that small charge it's put in? I'm seeing what looks like a capacitive dropper circuit. Uh, there's the coil for the quartz movement. Uh, let's try and lift this circuit board out without damaging those little copper wires. Ooh, it's quite a lot on it. The capacitor is 0.22, it's 220 nanofarad. That's all that's required. Ultimately, all it's doing is charging that battery. Uh, and the quartz movement itself won't take much current. Um, internally, and I'll just zoom down for this, I'm seeing a, a copper link joining the two middle terminals, so I would classify those as neutral and the two outer terminals as live, just like a, a typical British meter. We've got a very heavy link, and uh, one of the contacts here, there's the contacts with a little actuation wheel. Um, let's uh, override those and just... Are you going to see the contacts? The contacts are behind translucent plastics, you may not actually see them. They look quite decisive, I can hear a ping when they open. All right, okay. Uh, I'm going to pause momentarily and I'm going to take a look at this circuit board and kind of reverse engineer it and see what's inside it. The reverse engineering is complete. I'll pause momentarily so you can take a snapshot of this uh, circuit board if you want to actually reverse engineer it yourself. This winding here is the two solder pads going out to the, uh, the actual motor itself. This is interesting. It's a uh, non-polarized electrolytic capacitor. There's a quartz timing chip called an FXZ556 or FXZ556. Unfortunately, a search for that pulled up two things. It's clear that uh, Google just thought I meant 556 ti dual timer chip because that's all that came up in the schematics. A few pictures of the chip but not the actual data sheet. And as usual, data sheet archive said, oh yeah, we've got your data sheet. Click here for adverts. And yes, they had adverts. They didn't have the data sheet. There's a surprise. These resistors and that diode here are a separate part of the circuit board. They are for an indicator LED that when the actual switch contacts on. We've got a capacitor here, an X2 capacitor, which represents uh, the, it's the capacitive dropper for the power supply. We've got a slightly creepy metal oxide resistor across the incoming supply to the circuit board with no fusing or thermal protection. Uh, rectifier, the output to the nickel metal hydride backup cell, um, and then a green LED, which is a very interesting purpose. I've reconnected the leads onto the unit so I can show you that what that green, green LED is doing. It's quite clever. So uh, let's take a look at the schematic which I have conveniently underneath. So it starts off with the supply come in here, live and neutral, could be any way around, it's just AC, it doesn't really matter. It goes to this metal oxide varistor first to clamp any voltage spikes. It's a very small one. Um, I, it's 10 millimeter diameter, I think. I didn't check that. Uh, but as I say, there's no protection if it starts uh, doing what they do and it breaks down over time, particularly with a time switch that could be switching contactors, then that's a bit odd. We've got two 470 ohm resistors that are just designed to limit the inrush current to the circuit. We've got the dropper capacitor, which is a 220 nanofarad X2, which is a standard suppression capacitor with a 1 meg ohm discharge resistor across it to actually take off any residual charge when it's disconnected if you're tinkering with the time switch. Although, technically speaking, yeah, with that, I suppose if, uh, if there's no other load on, it could hold a charge. We've got the full bridge rectifier, full bridge rectifier, and then a couple of interesting details. The green LED in the front that says power, power, is actually connected in series with all the other circuitry, which makes sense with the capacitive dropper. It means that all the current going to charge this nickel metal hydride cell goes through that LED, so it shows that well, it, it's just an efficient way of adding a power indicator without uh, having to have more current for it because it is just sharing the current that's there already. We've got the nickel metal hydride cell, and parallel with that are a green LED, a, what I'm guessing is a 100 nanofarad uh, capacitor, and then an electrolytic capacitor rated 470 megafarad 
10 volt and that makes a voltage rail that will normally be in the range of 1.2 to 1.5 but the maximum it can ever be is 2 volts because this LED here will turn on if something goes horribly wrong. If you were to unplug this little battery, this uh, rechargeable cell, then this caps the voltage in that rail stops going up too high and this is good because over time these cells do tend to fail that way they tend to go sort of high resistance um, and that's just to protect the circuitry and it means that if you unplug the cell the clock will run as normal but it means you could then theoretically hot swap a new cell and I don't know if they really recommend that because it is reference to the mains effectively that then goes into this FXZ or FXZ556 chip and that has a crystal and the two decoupling capacitors. I could show you the crystal and the two decoupling capacitors. The crystal's on the other side here, are the two tiny little load uh, capacitors that just keep that crystal stable. Uh, and we've got the odd thing. It's electrolytic, but it's a non-polarised electrolytic. It can operate either way around. And the outputs of this alternate. This one will go positive, this one will go negative, and then one second later, this one will go positive and that one will go negative. They'll swap polarity. And what happens each time that happens is that there's a sudden pulse of current through the, the coil that way, and then a pulse of current through the other way. So each alternate second, it's like going north pole, south pole, north pole, south pole. And another interesting feature of this circuit board is the fact it has a strategic hole through. So you can see the little motor in there with its poles rotating backwards and forwards inside, well, rotating in one direction. There's a name for that motor that escapes me right now. I should have looked that up. It's designed so that, although it's only sort of two poles, each time it fires round, it ends up with a pole just going beyond the point that it would actually get attracted back the way, but the next pole is in line just so it then, in the opposite polarity, it gets pulled round. And it means that it's a very simple motion that relies on sort of the structure of the metal core around the magnet to actually ensure that it always overflies a bit and goes uh, into the position ready for the next sort of phase. It means that it go only goes in one direction, and it, even though it's effectively being fed by pulsed AC. It's a very simple circuit. There is one other bit, and it is this rather inefficient bit down here. These resistors and this diode are kind of separate. They go out to feed an LED, and they are on the switching contact, and the two resistors are in parallel to give their two uh, 200k resistors, and they effectively give 100k. And then there's an LED, and they could have put an, a, a diode in series that LED, but they've put a diode across the LED, and it just means that was the dull red LED that glowed when the contacts were closed, because uh, it's just wired directly to the contacts. And uh, that's not an efficient way of doing that, but ultimately they've had to... Keep in mind this is a universal voltage device. It can go from 100 volts to 240 volts, so uh, it was just designed to cater for that, and those resistors will get quite hot when the output is on. Is there anything else to say about this? Yes, there's stuff to show you. That's what there is. I shall zoom back out again. And we'll bring the clock back in again with its wires reconnected. Here is the clock. And I shall take the exposure off of this and I shall turn the light off. I've taken the battery out uh, and I'll just plug this in and you'll see, see the little green light there and it blinks out every time this uh, causes a current pulse and it pulls the voltage rail down that is effectively capping the supply voltage to two volts but it will never normally light i'll unplug this it will never never normally light i should lock the exposure off so it doesn't yew you up and down uh, if the battery is plugged in and working so i've unplugged this from the supply while i do this while i'm fingering the circuit boards i shall plug that back in again Put the little cap over to stop it dropping out. And if I plug this in now, it will start ticking again. But that LED is not lighting now because the voltage has been capped by the nickel metal hydride cell, which is now effectively being charged because there's enough current to charge the cell and also run the clock movement, which is very, very low power. There's that uh, green LED down there, the little power LED uh, that is illuminated through. It's in series of this circuitry. And also you can barely see the red uh, LED glowing down there. You see that? No, it's, I'm going to have to shield it like this. You can barely see the red LED glowing because it's bright enough to see, but not super mega bright. So, interesting little device. 
I shall uh, turn the light back on again. And it does look quite well made. The only bit I don't like is the metal locks I've wristed uh, across the supply at the back. I don't know how critical that is. I don't know if they do feel in that volatile mode later on. It seems chunkily built. The contacts seem big enough and they are uh, a fast action contact. They tend to open quite quickly. Let's uh, see what the separation is if I wind this round. The contact separation is about one millimeter. Oh, if you actually, if you put it into manual mode, the contacts open much wider. It's opening a full three millimeters when you actually put it into uh, manual mode. Yeah, it's an interesting circuit. It looks quite well designed. It looks chunky and robust. It looks quite a nice time switch. And I like that feature of just the LED being used to clamp the voltage in the rails so that it doesn't suffer damage. It's, it makes me think of how many of the quartz clocks do you get that you can't change the rechargeable battery. And once that rechargeable battery goes, then, then you're screwed, basically, because uh, you aren't going to be able to, unless you actually open it up and find the correct cell to put in, you're not going to be able to change it sort of in situ, so to speak. But nice, it's a chunky little thing. I can see why they're popular in Japan for street lighting and stuff like that. Yeah, nice, smart little units.